So I've got a lot to get to this morning, so I'm going to jump right into it. We're, today we're going to be in 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 5, and I'm going to read verses 8 through 20. But if any man provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Let not a widow be taken into the number under three score years old, having been the wife of one man, well reported of for good works, if she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, if she have washed the saints' feet, if she have received the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. But the younger widows refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. And withal, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. I will, therefore, that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. For some are already turned aside after Satan. If any man or woman that believeth have widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. Right off the bat this week as we jump into verse 8, But if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith, and is worse than an infidel. This is in reference to last week's scripture and verse 4. But if any widow have children or nephews, let them first learn to show piety at home and to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. So this verse is really about two things. Number one, it is telling us that the care for our elders is our responsibility. They took care of us. We must take care of them. But you'll also notice in verse 8, it is clearly not talking about just widows or women, but the men and women who took care of us. Verse 8, but if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house. His own were his own house. Mom, dad, grandpa, oompa, whatever you called them, we covered that last week. But the thing I want you to notice about this week's scripture is verse 8. He hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. The rest of this chapter and some of the next talk about the doing of good works. Good works will not get you into heaven. The only way to achieve salvation is by accepting Christ as your Savior. So you cannot earn your faith through good works. But, but... You can deny your faith by not doing good works. You can say, I am a Christian. But if you are not living a Christian life, your works deny your faith. If you don't take care of the people in your family, in your house, in a godly way, you can claim all of the Christianity that you want, but you have denied your faith. Knowing what you should do and doing it are not the same thing. I can spend this entire next year telling you every Sunday about the diet that I'm on. If I keep getting fatter, you know better. This is one of the big problems that we see in America today. It's not the people who are not saved that are the problem. It's the people who think that they're saved but they refuse to act like the doctrines of Scripture teach. I remember as a kid, you would see some old, loud, drunk, 
start loud talking and screaming about he can whoop any man in the building. And somebody would say, he's about to let his alligator mouth overrun his canary butt. What that means is all the talk in the world is useless unless you are man or woman enough to back all that talk up. If you are not living a godly life, if you're not spending time in prayer, in scripture, in fellowship, if you're not taking care of your family at home and your church family right here, you have denied your faith. And once again, because I don't want you to think that I'm just making this up or that I have taken a vague, obscure scripture and twisted it, I'm going to back that up with scripture. 1 John 4, verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. He that loveth not, knoweth not God. No matter how much they demand that you are wrong for saying it, no matter what the words are coming out of their mouth, he that loveth not, knoweth not God, and has denied the faith. Matthew chapter 7, verse 18. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Why? Because if it does not bear fruit, it is useless. If you do not take care of your own, if your piety does not start at home, like verse 4 says, if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them learn to show piety toward their own family and to repay their parents, you have denied the faith. And the scripture says, and is worse than an infidel. The word infidel also translates to unbeliever. How can someone be worse than an unbeliever? Well, an unbeliever can be saved. Someone whose actions deny the faith, they believe they already are saved. And they will slide all the way into damnation with Matthew 7, 1 on their lips. Judge not that ye be not judged. And the scripture that answers that the best is Hebrews 6, when I read often, verse 4. For it is impossible... For those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. It is impossible because even though they have fallen away, they see themselves as being godly because they talk a good game. Too many people will stand up and say, I love God with their mouth, only to deny their faith with their actions. As we move to verse 9, remember that these are the guidelines for a system of care that had been abused. Some are outdated. We don't wash feet anymore. And as guidelines, unlike verse 8, verse 9 can be changed according to situation. As a quick example, verse 9. Let not a widow be taken into the number under three score years old, having been the wife of one man. Three score, three score years old means 60. Now, does that mean that at 59 years and 11 months, we say, no, I'm sorry, you have to starve. Of course not. Verse 4 and verse 8 are about faith. This, verse 9, goes back to doctrine, how we treat each other. So this lays out those guidelines. But scripture also makes clear that it is the spirit of the guidelines that is the important part, not the letter of the law. In Mark, we find three great examples of this. Mark chapter 2, verse 23. He was going on the Sabbath day through the grain fields, Jesus, and his disciples began as they went to pluck the ears of grain. 
The Pharisees said to him, Behold, why do they do that which is not lawful on the Sabbath day? He said to them, Did you never read what David did when he had need and was hungry? He and those who were with him. How he entered into God's house when Abathar was high priest and ate the showbread, which is not lawful to eat except for the priests, and gave also to those who were with him. He said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Mark chapter 3, verse 1. Another time, Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was immediately completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. And this last one may be the best because this is Jesus using the mistreatment of family as an example. Mark chapter 7, verse 6. He answered them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But they worship me in vain, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For you set aside the commandment of God and hope tightly to the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups, and you do many other such things. He said to them, full well do you reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and he who speaks evil of father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, If a man tells his father or his mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is a corbin, that is to say, given to God, then you no longer allow him to do anything for his father or his mother, making void the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down, you do many things like this. Clearly, God gives us commands, and he gives us the church guidelines, the doctrines. And while we cannot compromise on what faith is and how people of faith will act, not should act, but will act, we also cannot use the guidelines of the church to hold or to press others down like the Pharisees did. That also makes it very important that we know what our faith is based on and what the good teachings are. Verse 9. Let not a widow be taken into the number under three score years old, having been the wife of one man. The number, this means the group or the list, under 60. That is quite old at that time. When this was written, priests were required to step down and retire at 50 years old. That's when they were seen as old. Having been the wife of one man, this doesn't mean she was married once. Here in a minute, Paul encourages young widows to remarry. This means that she was a faithful wife to the man or men that she was legally married to. Verse 10, well reported of for good works. If she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. This verse is cool because it's not giving commands or doctrines. It is giving examples. If she brought up children, we also see earlier that a widow indeed cannot have people to care for her. So this doesn't mean a woman has to have children to receive care. Also, in modern terms, we don't wash feet anymore. Today, this could easily read, well reported of for good works. If she brought up her children in church with the knowledge of Jesus, if she gave money to feed strangers, if she took care of her parents when they were old, if she had her Sunday school class make toys for sick children, if she has diligently followed every good work. Remember the verse earlier about a tree and its fruit. 
This is saying, did she produce fruit? Verse 11. But the younger widows refused, for they have begun to wax wanton against Christ. When they have begun to wax, wax wanton against Christ, they will marry. The idea was, once you were a widow, your support came from the church. And that younger women, if they were put in the system or if they were honored with support, would then marry and even have relationships with men who were able to support them, but they would keep it quiet, hide the relationship, and end up with two incomes. That is what this is all about. Again, anytime you set up a system to help people, people will find a way to abuse it. Verse 12, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. This is saying with the verse before it that the temptation of money and the ability to defraud the church can cause some people to turn from their faith. This is Paul saying, nip it in the bud. He's telling Timothy, this may be a problem. So before it gets to the point that it is a problem, let's eliminate the problem. If only we could learn to think that way in our own lives. If only we could avoid sinful behavior instead of apologizing for it. If only we could see that if scripture hurts, it's not because God wants you mad or because he wants you to turn on him. God wants us to change, to be transformed in this life. We want the forgiveness. We just don't want the responsibility that goes with it. What an awesome lesson Paul is teaching to anyone who will read and listen. Eliminate potential problems and they won't be problems later. Verse 13. And withal, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house. And not only idle, but tattlers also and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. Idle hands are the devil's playground. I love that saying. And again, to put this in a cultural context, because it says they will become tattlers and busybodies, that means gossipers and rumor spreaders. And going from house to house means they will have their nose in everyone else's business. In today's world, this scripture is just as much for the men as it is for the women. No women in this world can out-gossip a group of old men. I believe everyone here knows that to be true. I also think that if this is telling men and women, keep your mind and your business in your own house. You ever notice, for example, a married woman, young woman, will start to hang out with her friends, going all the places that she did when she was single, and pretty soon you hear that her and her husband are getting divorced. That's what going house to house means. This is a true example I'm about to give you. I just saw this last week online. One of my cousins got married the day before Trish and I did. He and his wife were married almost 30 years. Every day, he got off work and he went to Denver's Depot. That's a bar in Charleston, West Virginia. And he stayed there every evening until it closed. I saw the other day that he had left his wife. They are divorced. He is about to become remarried. You know who he's going to marry? The bartender from Denver's Depot. True story. So this one is for the men and the women. Worry about your house. Don't go wandering from house to house. And you can avoid those kind of problems before they even are problems. Verse 14. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion for the adversary to speak reproachfully. Again, we see I will, Paul's advice, what he would do in Timothy's situation, remarry. So the earlier scripture about wife and one husband is covered here. It's okay to remarry, bear children. And the rest is Paul saying, remarry and be happy. 
Live your life, enjoy your youth in a godly way, and give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Is the same thing we read last week in 1 Thessalonians 5.22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. In this case, adversary is the adversaries of the church, of whom Satan is the chief adversary. But it also means in this case, be godly. Live a godly life of example. So people are not able to speak bad about you or about the church. Verse 15. For some are already turned aside after Satan. This is Paul saying, this is already going on. Everything I am saying, I am saying because I've seen it or I have seen it coming. The abuse of a system to help people. What becomes of people who live off of that system. And because Paul has seen it, verse 16. <clears throat> if any man or woman that believeth have widows, let them relieve them and not the church be charged, that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. This is him, Paul, saying again, take care of your own house, your own family, honor your father and mother, show your piety first at home, let not the church be charged. So the church isn't bogged down, that it may relieve widows who are widows indeed. So the church as a body, as a group, can care for the truly needy, the truly destitute, the people with nothing. Verse 17. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Let the elders that rule well, again we see a stipulation that it is the elders who rule or who are responsible for the church, but it is also the elders who rule well. If we think back to verse 10, well reported of for good works, if she had brought up children, lodged strangers, washed the saints' feet, relieved the afflicted, diligently followed every good work. These are the examples given for widows. The same examples can be given for the elders, that they are well reported of for good works, and they have diligently followed every good work. An elder who shows fruit in their life is one that we can say is ruling well. Verse 17, be counted worthy of double honor. The word honor is, again, where we get the word honorarium. So this is talking about finances. Today we pay preachers and school teachers in about the same way. We look at what it takes for them to survive comfortably, and then we pay them based on that. It's very socialized. It is most often not based on what they give the community. As an example, a church looking for a new pastor may want a young man with no kids and a wife yet because it's easier to pay his rent. That doesn't tell you what he is worth to the church. So this is saying, pay him what he's worth. Verse 17, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. When we see who labor in the word, we think of the word as meaning scripture. But just like in chapter 4, verse 13, till I come give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine, the word read means read aloud. So labor in the word doesn't mean to memorize scripture. It means to teach the scripture, to preach the scripture aloud. Preachers, evangelists, missionaries, these are the folks Paul is telling the church to support. And while you see that Paul is telling the church to support the elders who are sharing the word, he's also saying the ones that do a good job, pay them double. Give them double the honor. Take extra good care of them. This is the time in the sermon that most preachers want to pass the plate again and give everyone a chance to show their gratitude. But wait, that's not the important part. Especially they who labor in word and doctrine. You notice it doesn't say support the preacher that you like the best. Or you should, should support the preacher who always makes you smile. Think about tipping in a restaurant. If the service is good, you tip a little more. If service is bad, you tip a little less. This scripture is saying, 
to pay your preacher what he is worth, but unlike going to a restaurant where you base your tip on how you were served, how quick they responded to your needs, were they friendly and courteous, when it comes to a preacher and his worth, you base that on two things. Is he preaching God's word? Is he living by and teaching the doctrines of scripture? Those are the preachers you take extra good care of. And I promise you that a preacher who preaches from God's word will not leave you with warm, fuzzy feelings every Sunday. This scripture says those are the preachers that you need to honor double. If you go to church on Sunday and you usually put a $10 bill in the plate and the whole sermon... The preacher is just reading scripture after scripture after scripture that just steps all over your toes. Drop a 20 in the plate that week because that preacher just did you a favor. I'm not preaching to chase your money. This church pays me and pays me well. If you change the 10 you usually put in the plate to a 20, my pay won't change a bit. And that pleases me just fine. But the church finances will go up, and praise God, that's something we should all be after. I was preaching long before anybody ever offered to pay me for it, so these scriptures about caring for your preacher are always hard for me to preach. But the most important thing for me or any other minister that you ever choose to support is the word. Does he preach it? Does he live it? Verse 18. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. i got to tell you, this verse is the one that I've looked forward to for about four months. As I got up every Sunday to preach from 1 Timothy, I would think about this verse with anticipation. This is so important, and I want you to hear it carefully. Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. That means when you see Kelly or Calvin or one of the trustees outside cutting the grass, they are allowed to eat as much of it as they like. I'm such a simple creature. I really have been waiting four months for that joke. <laughs> Verse 18. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Paul's backing up scripture with scripture. In Luke 10, 7, And in the same house remain eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his hire, go not from house to house. Matthew 10, 10, Nor script for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, uh, nor yet the staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. We see that Jesus makes the same statement as Paul's closing. The laborer is worthy of his reward. But it is in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy 25, 4 that we read, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox when he treadeth out the corn. The Jews see this in Deuter Deuteronomy, and for them it is literal. They don't muzzle the ox so they can eat while they work. Paul uses this symbolically to say, if you have a preacher who's working, make sure that he's eating while he's working. You can think of this as providing finances, but also, and for me, this is a big one. We have a potluck here at least once a month. We have snacks, pastries, cookies every Sunday. If a preacher went hungry around this congregation, it would be his fault, not yours, I assure you. And one of the things I always love about potlucks, besides all that food, is the fact that sometimes we feed people who need to be fed. People who would never ask to be fed, we get to feed them. And we feed them not like they were some poor person who needs us, but we feed them like we would our family at Thanksgiving. We pull them up a chair. We hand them a plate. I know it's a little off subject here, but don't ever underestimate the power of a potluck. Our Lord started that tradition with a few loaves and some fishes, and it is as much a ministry as anything else we do. Verse 19. 
against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. This is Paul once again using scripture. He's preaching from the word, in this case Deuteronomy 19, 15. One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin. In any sin that he sinneth out of the mouth of two witnesses or the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. This is about hearsay, gossip, rumors, and the other things that can often affect a church and its preacher. Remember when Paul told Timothy, treat the women as mothers and sisters with all purity. This verse is sort of the other side of that coin. It is saying for you to accuse a preacher of sin, there has to be witnesses to the sin. Now, I can sin just fine and no one see it but God. Guess what? It is still sin. And I must ask God to forgive me daily, and I do. But this is talking about sins against people in the church. The church itself, or the good teachings, doctrines of Scripture. As an example, if I show up next week with a new Mercedes, and I just say, oh yeah, I got a new car. But I don't explain how I got it, how I was able to pay for it. Rumor might start to fly that I'm stealing money. How else could I pay for it? That is what this is saying, not to let rumor become fact. Don't let unfounded gossip ruin the church and its leaders. By the way, I never spend that much money on a car. This is a great thing to practice with all people, not just preachers and elders, but all people. We have to stop expecting the worst out of each other. This is one of the biggest challenges people, Christians, face, and I am one of the most challenged. I admit, and have admitted before, when someone does something really, really nice for me, my first instinct is, it's a trap, or what do you want from me that you're doing something nice? Because people don't just do nice things for no reason. There's a little of that in all of us. Especially if the rumor or accusation is something that goes along with the narrative we agree with. We must stop looking for the bad in everyone and start looking for the good in us. I think that's what Matthew 7, 5 means more than anything else. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. It doesn't say you can't help your brother out. It doesn't say judge not lest ye be judged. It doesn't say it is wrong to get to a place where you can point out that a brother needs your help. What it does say is work on you first. And I don't mean to work on you for about five minutes and think you're good enough and then go looking for splinters to pull. I mean work on you first daily, situationally, we need to stop wearing stuff that says, what would Jesus do? And start doing the stuff that Jesus did. Verse 20. Them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. Now this one again is talking about the preachers and what it means is clear. When you find out you have a preacher who is stealing, chasing women in the congregation, who doesn't honor their parents, the doctrines of scripture, you are to rebuke that preacher before all publicly so that they may be ashamed. You are to tell the church that this preacher did something that you know to be true and they are unrepentant of. You are to rebuke that preacher so that other men and women who would try and use the church to make a quick dollar, or who would use the church to take advantage of people, so people like that will think twice before they try and defraud the church. Now that sounds like tough talk today. We never ever want to tell another person they're wrong. We say things like, everyone's entitled to their own opinion. Just because you're entitled to be wrong does not make you right. We are to confront each other. We are to do it with the truth, and we get the truth from Scripture, not from opinion, and not from emotions and the feelsies. 1 Corinthians 5, 5 says, 5, 1, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, 
that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that, that hath done this deed might have taken away from among you. This is Paul telling the church to call sin out, to be willing to point out sin, because if you do not, if you pretend that the sin doesn't exist, or that the sin is just a little sin, if you act like it is not sinful behavior, it will destroy the whole church from the inside. He uses leavening, yeast in the place of poison. If it, sin, is allowed, it will poison the whole church. I want to wind down with this one thought. Why is it that we do not call sin, sin anymore? Why was it a problem for the Corinthians? Because they had become puffed up. They had become high and mighty. You see, the problem with calling sin, sin is that you're next. That you're next. The old saying, people that live in glass houses shouldn't throw rocks at the neighbors. We're all sinners. But in church, we want to be righteous. We don't want people to know that we have faults. So we see someone else struggle with a sin and we allow people into our church who we know live lives of unrepentant sin and we say nothing. Not because we're afraid of offending them, not really, but because we are afraid someone might point out our sin and then we face the choice of giving up that sin or having to publicly wallow in it. We will privately wallow in sin all day long. And when the light comes on, we scatter like cockroaches. No one wants a light on their own sin. So we tolerate each other in silent shame. The scripture today reminds us that our strength is in Jesus Christ and in our connection and true love for each other. Guys, I thank you for listening to me this morning. If you'll stand about your head.